Wow, look at you. You were all here. I kind of was half expecting. I mean, I know this is going to be the best session, hopefully, of the festival, but going on last night's party, which I wasn't at, but I hear it was not just the best party at Dockfest ever, but apparently the best party like in the world ever. So um, congratulations, you've made it. Uh, and uh, John has joined us all the way from uh, London. He's got the train up early this morning. Now, John Snow is a man that needs little introduction. He's been the face of Channel 4 News for over 25 years where along with his infectious enthusiasm and distinctive down-to-earth approach, he's also noted for his penchant for a fancy tie or two. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I don't know if you'll spot the Sheffield colours on John's tie, but uh, that was a little gift presented to him when he arrived this morning. <laughs> Gets a round of applause. <laughs> Prior to getting his feet under the news desk, he was a correspondent in East Africa, Rome, and Washington. He's been banged up in a Malaysian prison. He's found his name on a death list in El Salvador, and he's interviewed everyone from Margaret Thatcher and Monica Lewinsky to Nelson Mandela. He has loved the breadth and depth of the country, and I think Sheffield loves him a little bit too, going on the people that actually made it here after last night's party. We're in for an absolute treat. The next 60 minutes will be a gallop through the life and work of Jon Snow. And a gallop through the life and work of Jon Snow is essentially oh, a whistle-stop. I feel a complete stop. fraud being here. I think I've only made about a dozen documentaries in my entire working life, so what I'm doing at DocFest, I don't really know. But that is not true, because, John, you essentially make a documentary every single day. I mean, your documentaries, in terms of where we're at right now in television and content and how things are moving, you know, a short film is still a documentary. Yeah, but you can think of these massive undertakings that people have, have managed to achieve here and we are mere pigments. Well, we are very, very lucky to have you. Now, uh, you've described yourself as a hack who wants to change the world. Now, yeah. is that still true? Is that, is that what you want definitely, to do yeah, with your life? Absolutely. I mean, that's what we're all about. I mean, it's, nobody makes a documentary without wanting somehow to change the world, for better or worse. I mean, one way or the other. Definitely. I, mean, I, I think, actually, all the best operatives in our medium are politically motivated. Uh, and we're a small p, I mean, um, but I think we definitely want to bring about change, change in understanding, change in activity, change in behavior, change in politics, life, sex, whatever. And at this point in your career, would you say that you've done that? I mean, what would be the biggest I would biggest say I've made absolutely no contribution, whatever, but, <laughs> but, but I've had a good time doing it. <laughs> That is not true. Now, uh, I don't know how you feel about this. By the I way, the socks were made to go with another tie, but of course... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying, though, I think the clash is trendy. It's very yeah. on trend. It's, mm. it's working. Uh, now, the thing that sets you apart from most other anchors, I think, is that... You know, you're engaged in the world, you're involved in the world, you're busy in the world, and we can kind of see you around doing things. You're involved in charities, you're involved with art galleries. And uh, does that help in kind of in what you do every day in your day job? And also, how is it that you remain impartial, you know, the fact that you are so engaged with the world? Is um, it easy? Well, it's a massive advantage. I mean, there's just no question at all that uh, if, if you keep plugging into different things, you, you keep learning new things. You, 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 you meet amazingly interesting people. I mean, for example, if you took something like Tate, where I was a trustee, and where I'm chair of Tate members, uh, you, you kind of, it, there is another world, another complete world into which you, you dive, and, and a world in which you very often know very little. Uh, and it's just completely refreshing, and you come back to the other job, and it, it gives you perspective, and all those sort of things. But the other thing is, you know, recognition is a fantastic thing. You, you go on a train and you sit on a table, four of you there. Uh, this happened to me actually traveling from York, not Sheffield, last year. And it, this, this was really fantastic. T uh, two people in their 60s there, a man and a woman, and, and a Mongolian woman here. Mongolian. Not, not often you sit opposite a Mongolian, but there it is. That's what, what was going on. These two people turned out to be deaf. Uh, one of them couldn't speak and one could. And so uh, th this guy started going to me like this. <laughs> um, and then to his neighbor like this, you know, sort of thing. So I, I realized what was going on. And she then started talking to me, the, the one that could talk, 
was saying what he was saying. And then I realized that I could put my computer into 24 point and start speaking to him direct, um, you know, on, on, as it were, online, but <laughs> next to each other. And um, what I discovered was they were b both in their 60s. They both had had meningitis as children. One was five and one was six. One lost the power of speech and the power of hearing. The other lost the power of hearing. And suddenly I was into a world I had never had any kind of experience of at all. And yet for an hour and a half, we talked about being deaf. And the silly thing is that after all that, I never managed to get up the courage to ask them what their relationship was. Were they brother and sister? Were they simply people who had meningitis and belonged to a club or something? Um, so I don't know courage. that. But then, then, of course, I discovered that the woman who was listening intently here was a Mongolian economist <laughs> teaching at Warwick University. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, these things happen to you all the time. And that is, may, for a hack, it is a very fertile world. It's great. Very, very good. And so, I mean, it's quite interesting. Even this bloke outside stopped me for an autograph, and he turned out to have had my cousin Dan <laughs> the day before, about whom he was rather more pleased than me. But there we I go. don't know about there that. I don't know about that. But it's interesting how you always you describe yourself as a hack. You're a hack. You're a hack. You're a yeah. hack through and through. Definitely. And in spite of because I like the news going out night. and just ferreting about, trying to get the stuff, come back, put it on the air. Ferreting about. Ferreting about. <laughs> yeah. On your bicycle. On my bike. A bike, a bike, I think, is an essential for any filmmaker or, or, or journalist or activist within our profession. A bike is essential if you live in the urban area, be it Sheffield or London or whatever, because you just cut out an enormous amount of completely needless time-wasting. And, of course, you stay reasonably fit and, and you subscribe to a, a greener world. But that is what makes you so interesting. And I don't think I've ever spotted another news anchor on a bicycle in London, but I've seen Paxo you. Paxo rides a bike, I believe. Oh, I does he? I've never seen him on it, but I am told he does. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's just got one. He just looks at it. <laughs> but uh, I've seen you a number of times. You know, I always bump into you, and you've got your cycle helmet with you, and so you're always on your bike. But uh, it, it's almost like you're in the world, and you're kind of your feet are totally just... Yeah. But how can we speak boots, with the world the if we're not world. in it? You know, that seems to me the absolute. And the great thing about the age in which we live, and I'm sorry to bore people, but the truth is we are in the golden age, absolutely the dawn of the golden age of everything we do, of journalism, of communication, of filmmaking. This is the great moment. Because previously, you know, when I started, it was a one-way street. You were literally telling them the way it is, and that's it. And if you've got a letter in green ink, underlined in red twice a week. Well, that's about the only communication you had with anybody. Um, and now, one's live on Twitter, when one's live on air, you are talking to people all the time on the social network. People email you, you are accessible. It's, a, it's democratized, the whole sharing of information. I always believe when I sit down on Channel 4 News that you and I, you the viewer and I, are going on a shared journey of discovery. We're on a voyage. It's such an adventure. You know, and today, today's a hellish day. I sit on the train thinking about what we're going to do tonight. Bloody hell, have you seen what's happened? The dog, the dog of war has come back to bite the military hand that screwed it in the first place. This is, this is the moment when America faces up to the true horror and consequence of what it's done in Iraq. Can you imagine Iraq's second city has been seized by the group that is beyond even Al-Qaeda's tolerance? It's an amazing moment. And what has happened? They have captured all the weaponry that the United States left in Iraq, supposedly to arm the American-trained Iraqi army. And that weaponry is now going to be used in Syria. I mean, what an infernal dance. We should deal with that. We want to deal with the Ugandan foreign minister, who is uh, implacably opposed to homosexuality, subscribes to a government that locks people up for a consensual act between... Uh, same-sex individuals, and this man stands every chance of being elected to being the president of the United Nations. Wow, what a start. Where do we go from there? And so listening to you now, I mean, obviously we're in a very different context We could now, be having, having our editorial discussion. meeting, which well, is going on right <laughs> now. <laughs> but you're clearly very, very passionate about all of these issues. 
How do you go onto Channel 4 News and remain objective and remain impartial when you're talking about these things that are happening around the world? Well, I, I think you have to be fair. I mean, we need to hear the foreign minister out, find out, you know, what it is that, that upsets him so much. Is he perhaps, you know, closet gay himself? That can often... <laughs> no, that can often be the case. I think Mugabe's a bit wet that way, you know. Um, it, it's, it, 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 it's interesting. And these things... Um, uh, you've got to give fair play to everybody, but at the same time, you can't deny to yourself what you actually feel. I mean, um, you are bound to have an opinion, but the, your opinion is of no value to the audience. The opinion of the people you're interviewing is what they want to hear. Uh, although I think it inevitably informs your questioning. It must do. You can't sort of... By the way, I, I'm a complete right-wing fascist. I'm going to ask you the following question. No, I mean, you've somehow got to be uh, reasonably, you know, balanced. Balanced. And throughout your whole career, so you, you have remained balanced, and that's why you're so brilliant at what you do. But have there ever been any moments when perhaps you've crossed the line? I think you do cross the line more or less every day, to one way or another. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, accidentally, you know, I mean... Um, you just can't sort of take a deep breath and, and, and think, hang on, what am I supposed to, well, where am I supposed to be in this equation? Um, but, you know, actually, I'm somebody who likes being regulated. Isn't that an extraordinary thing? I think I need regulating. So I like working for Ofcom. I like the, the, <laughs> I like the, 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 the regime. And actually, I've often been taken to Ofcom, but never yet been found guilty. Really? Yeah, yeah, it's, it, that it, is it, a badge of honour. I, actually, I, I, it was a very interesting thing. The other day, I was talking to a group of ITV regional editors, and somebody stood up and asked me, what do you do about competing with the monster? I said, what is the monster? They said, the BBC. I said, the BBC's a monster? It's a pussycat. And I said, well, no, I, no, they're a serious force. And of course they are, they're a wonderful force and I absorb a huge amount that the BBC does, but they're not a monster. I, I said, look, you know, it, it, the BBC is constrained. It's constrained in a way that we are not. I mean, BBC does have issues about public funding and all the rest of it. We don't have any of those problems, even though I'm, for example, in the public sector, but we have to make our own money. Uh, we have to make our own money, you. You, you make more money than I do. I mean, in terms of... No, no, John, I mean... that is not true. No, I mean in terms of the programme will generate viewers, more viewers. Oh, than oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, po true. yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, you're a cash cow. <laughs> um, but, um, no, the... Um, uh, and, and I said, how many of you editors have been up before Ofcom? And how many of you... Well, first of all, how many of you have been in before Ofcom? None of them had ever been taken to Ofcom. And I said, you're simply not taking enough risks. Mm -hmm. you, you've really got to go for it, boys and girls. Mm -hmm. You've really got to go for it. I mean, we need to be offending Ofcom every waking day of the week. <laughs> I know we do, we, uh, and then we can be regulated. But the idea that you've never knocked up against Ofcom is a pretty shattering indictment of your work. And for you, for someone like you, though it's fortunate that you... I'm pleased to have been up before Ofcom, but I'm also pleased never to have been done by them. Yeah, and you work, well, you, you work with, with an organisation that is up for taking risks. Yeah, definitely. definitely. In fact, um, Channel 4 is about to start, a, as you know well, a, a campaign which is centred around Born Risky. We're actually going to um, be risky in what we do within, within Limits. In fact, you will see in November, it's a very closely guarded secret, so I won't tell you what it is, but there is going to be a, a, a advertising campaign on Channel 4 which will be absolutely, will, will have every, every colonel in the country out there with a spear. Really? Yes, it's going to be very shocking. So, speaking of Born Even Risky... Even I was shocked, I must admit. Even you were shocked? <laughs> I was shocked. And what, um, we've got to wait until November? We have. Blimey. Okay. So, speaking of being born risky, yeah. would you say that you were born risky? I mean, no, is that I where it all comes from? No, I was born completely conventionally, very, very conventionally. And, um, uh, well, I mean, I came out through the, you know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I, I was born into a deeply conservative uh, um, family. My father was a public school headmaster. He became a bishop. Can you get any more conservative than that? Well, in those days, bishops now are revolutionaries, of course, but, but, um. but in those days they were old cranks. And, um, 
And to be absolutely honest, it wasn't until I did voluntary service overseas in Uganda that the scales fell from my eyes and I saw the world from the south looking north. And you know, you're with huge numbers of kids who are just as bright as any kid you've ever met, but they have absolutely no resources, no books, no nothing. And, and you just feel this can't be the way this planet works. There must be another way. And there is another way. I mean, Africa is now growing at 5%, and, and things are beginning to move. But um, that was a wonderful change. And that's what made me want to be a hack, because I wanted to find some way to go back to Uganda. And I did. And I got to interview Idi Amin and all that sort of stuff, and saw him driven out of the country, which was very exciting. And then I was on the road to lunacy. Lunacy. That's an interesting way of describing it. Now, uh, I really want to show some of your work. Ah. Oh. A little bit. We should, we should try and yeah. get through some of your work in terms of... So that was Uganda. Well, it's just worth <laughs> saying that on, on, on... And this, I think, is of use to us all. I mean, when I talk about being on the threshold of the golden age of, of communication and um, journalism and, and documentary making and the rest of it, You've got to remember that, for example, when I was in Uganda, and even when I was in El Salvador, an area, we'll just have a look at a bit of film in a moment, but in, in those days, we had no video, uh, no video, no mobile phones, of course, and actually there really were no landlines either in places like El Salvador and, and, and Uganda. And so you were on telex talking to people, and things that you shot on a Friday might not air until Wednesday the next week, because it took that long to get them out. There were no satellites, um, you know, so news was extremely whiskery by the time it actually got to air. It's an extraordinary thing. And yet it had a huge impact because, of course, everybody was watching three channels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's thought, isn't it? It was pre-Channel 4. It's remarkable it's almost called news, isn't it? It is, stage. it is, it is. <laughs> it probably took a week to it kind of more, get out It there. had more in common with a newsreel than it did with anything else. It was very little same-day news and, and so none from abroad. So that's where you started. Obviously, yeah. you're in an entirely different situation now, but it'd be great to have a little look at El Salvador, if we can. Leftist guerrillas who control much of the countryside here attacked a beer lorry out on the open road, a typical economic target designed to disrupt supplies. But a mile down the same road, rightists had attacked and horribly mutilated three men from the nearby town. People in passing buses simply stared and accepted it. And this is what the note left with the bodies reads. Don't come back because we know about your actions and what has happened to these people will happen to you. And it's signed EMN, which is an extreme right-wing paramilitary group. This kind of butchery, which is generally the activity of those on the right wing in this country, is the sort of thing which can be found on any roadside throughout El Salvador at this time. Did you hear that sort of really rather sort of pucker voice? <laughs> I've esterized since then. You have, you kind of mellowed. Oh, yeah, it's the bike. Your voice has <laughs> mellowed. <laughs> All the flies. Now, I mean, that, that clip, uh, there are some pretty harrowing images in there. I mean, that's from 1979, from mm. really, I suppose, what the start of your career. How do you cope <coughs> with seeing things like that? How do you cope? You've spent a lot of time in war zones on the front line in your life as a reporter. I think unless you become emotionally engaged in everything you're doing, you actually do become connected to what you're seeing. Allow yourself to be angry, to cry, to laugh if that's possible. Where you know, then I think it's very, very difficult to deal with. I, I met lots of people who, who were very brazen and said, "Oh, look, there's another one here. Look, take a look there. Look at that head. You know, look at the blood coming out, or whatever it is." Or the, Can you see the brain? <laughs> You know, and you say, hang on a minute, mate. I mean, the, 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 this, is a, this is a father, a, a son, a, a brother. Um, you know, you, you, can't, you can't do that. Think about what the loss. Uh, and, and that and was fellow hacks, people. Fellow, like well, or lots of cameramen in particular, you know. And, and, and I think that's the way they coped with it. But I think later it visited them and, and, and gnawed away at them. Whereas I felt, because I had the luxury of not being seen on camera while whatever one's reaction was, because you were filming what you were looking at. Um, I, I think y you did experience uh, pain and, 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 and grief. Um, uh, and I think that helped you to talk to the audience about it, to, to the viewer about it, uh, in, in your scripting. But it never visited me in dreams or 
It's not something which has ever haunted me. I mean, I can remember very vividly the physical sights, but they don't, they don't impinge upon my life. And I think that's because at the time in which you encounter these things, you allow them to get to you. I mean, you can't be mawkish about it. You can't, and you can't sort of um, well, as I say, cry on camera or do any of that sort of stuff. But I mean, as long as you, you get in touch with it, I think it's, it works. It, it, it's OK. And it was during this time that you actually found your name on a hit list in yes, El Salvador, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yep. They used to slide bits of paper under our hotel doors in the Camino Real. And then in the morning, there would be bodies laid out in the car park. They would not be media people. They would be peasants uh, who they were... Th there were death lists and death squads who went out to carry out their death lists. And then we would be on a death list. But this was just kind of intimidation. It wasn't... I don't, I don't know to what extent they really were following us with a view. We, we were once surrounded by a death squad, but uh, who had killed a Dutch crew, but, but uh, they decided not to kill us. I think because, in fact, our interpreter uh, had a packet of Marlborough, which made a huge difference. My goodness. I mean, Will you have one? There yeah. aren't many people. And you've got to put your gun down a bit when you're trying to get the fag out of the packet. And, <laughs> you know. But, John, there aren't many people that at that point wouldn't think, right, I'm bolting home, this is it, I'm leaving. No, you, you, you do think of log fires and things at that moment. You think, you think <laughs> and mummy's cooking. You know? uh, and at that point, wasn't, am I right in thinking your partner was pregnant? She was, yeah. With your daughter? With my daughter, yeah, one of my daughters. Well, I have two, but I mean, <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> And so how do you manage, I mean, uh, we both work with lots of people who are on the road all the time, and how do you manage that? How do you manage to have kind of a family life and kids and a partner and yet do what you do and go to places like that? It must be very, very difficult to balance the two. Dysfunctionally. Very dysfunctionally. I was telling you before about Juliette Binoche. I interviewed her the other day. It's actually still online at, on the Channel 4 website. And she'd got a new film out, which was about uh, a woman war photographer. It's called A Thousand Times Good Night. It's actually a very nice, mellow movie. Um, but basically, it's about a, a, a woman war photographer who, who just cannot, cannot step back from continuing to do what she loves and what she feels she's doing to change the world, which is to go out to save the children or go to Kabul and make films. And her relationship falls apart. She loses her two children. And it's, it's a sad film in that regard. And I, I said to Juliet Binoche, I said, well, you're, you're somebody who travels a lot. You've got two children. And indeed, your sister works for Corbis, the um, documentary-making um, outfit in Paris you, you, and all that. How have you managed to come to this accommodation? And she said, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't think I have. And she just wept and wept uh, uncontrollably. And... I found myself tearing up to some extent, and, and then I said to her, you know, I do remember when my daughter was three and a half, her coming to the door as I was leaving and saying, Daddy, please don't go. She didn't know where I was going. She just knew where I was going. Um, but, you know, uh, no, nobody can claim, I think, in our industry to be doing what we do and to have a wholly satisfactory story to tell. And how, how, do you feel, how do you feel about that at the moment? You just, you know, and what, and what do you do to cope with it? Because back then, there was no Skype. You drink heavily. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. And smoke a bit of weed. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was pretty Where good Where is the Daily Salvador. Mirror? <laughs> <laughs> Sex fiend snow smokes dope. Sex fiend thing. I mean, that's sticking around, isn't it? Oh, from what, earlier around. this year. Not to any detriment, I might say, on my own part. I've, I've enjoyed it. But is it right? Did you say that you think about sex every second? I didn't say that. No, no, no. I said, <laughs> I said, when you meet a woman for the first time, there is somewhere within that mm. vast mix of things which are swirling around when you meet anybody, like the deaf people at the state of the table, somewhere there is one subliminal moment when you sort of say, do I fancy this person? Right? 
And that's the way. That's it biology. Happens, it happens to be birds and bees. You know, that's life. Evolution. Evolution. We God, where be would, here if that Where didn't would happen. we be if this didn't happen? I mean, <laughs> what po-faced git decided to wake up in the morning and say, Snow says he thinks I'm out sex every minute of the day. <laughs> <laughs> what a sad life they must have. <laughs> I think he needs more sex, whoever it was. Well, a lot more, yeah. <laughs> right, now, uh, speaking of sex. Yes. <clears throat> moving on to, <clears throat> excuse me, Margaret Thatcher. Mm. <laughs> I've been seeing a bit of it with Theresa May. Um, <laughs> There is something about, about women in politics. It's interesting, very interesting. I mean, uh, but because actually you can see that men can't quite handle it. That business of her and Gove sitting on the front bench together, it was absolutely electric television, because they just couldn't deal with being sitting next, next to each other. <laughs> I mean, uh, it was fascinating, because <laughs> I, I, I happened to watch it as it was happening. Uh, yeah, I had the thing on on the desk, you know, and it, it was very, very interesting. Um, but as for interviewing Mrs. Thatcher, I mean, that was a sort of whole theatrical event in itself. You know, because the thing about interviewing Mrs. Thatcher, and I interviewed her a lot, probably about 20 times, um, because I was a diplomatic correspondent, which meant you had to traipse around Europe with her as she got angrier and angrier at each capital that she ever visited. <coughs> and one of the th key issues with Mrs. Thatcher was that she wanted to be back in Downing Street for her four hours kip. You know, she only slept for four hours. Um, and she hated any extra night in Europe. So a summit would end, um, and um, uh, she'd have the pilot waiting on the tarmac with the engine running, um, and she would then knock off the, her press conference and her interviews. And so the interviews would often be at sort of 2 o'clock in the morning. And, and you'd walk into the little room where she'd be sitting, and she'd have a, a glass of bells in her hand, you know, mm -hmm. double whiskey usually at least, um, and, and, and she'd be swinging away and say, oh, John, how perfectly lovely to see you. And you'd think, good God, she knows my name. And then you realise that, of course, Bernard Ingham had leant over to it. John Snow, Prime Minister, Channel 4, frightful bastard. Um, <laughs> of course, Ingham, Ingham was well, well ahead of his time because, of course, now there really is a John Snow who is a frightful bastard. He's the bastard son of the king. Um, <laughs> I interviewed him the other day and the interview ended over with me we, oh, there's we, some fans. Yeah, Viva Jon Snow, he's the nicest guy in Game of Thrones, no question. But anyway, I interviewed him the other day, very nice guy, Kit Harrington, and um, I said to him at the end of it, I said, Jon Snow, you know nothing. And he said, bastard. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but my Twitter feed is littered with you know nothing, um, which is for those adult members of the cast who don't normally waste time watching Game of Thrones, that is the watchword around Jon Snow, you know nothing. Do you watch it? I don't. Yeah, unlike un to, unlike the John? Prime Minister, who we now learn watches <laughs> the entire box set. <laughs> I tell you what, he's wreaked havoc with your Google juice, though, because when you punch in Jon Snow now... I know, it's a tragedy. Did the guy <laughs> nick my name? That's what I want to know, because it's spelt the same way. I mean, how many of those others are there? A, a lot, because monkey. I tried to get, you know, Gmail uh, for Jon Snow, and there were about 15 of them. <laughs> Um, speaking uh, of Margaret Thatcher, should oh yeah, we watch, a little, Thatcher, clip? Just, should we watch one, a little clip of you? Have we got that? At work. Oh my yeah. God. We've got I wonder if she's of... got those very modern... What we seem to have seen here in this last couple of days is, is a collision of visions. Your vision of Europe seems to be opening up the markets, getting on, mm -hmm. and yet there seems to be a more collective approach from the rest of Europe that wants a more caring, understanding, and perhaps more united politically. Oh, it's no, that's, not, um, that's not the division at all. There are some people who want a protected Europe. Uh, they want all kinds of protective mechanisms so that we don't have to compete in the outside world. When it comes to caring, let me say, we had long ago uh, both signed and ratified this document. That's the Council of Europe. There are some who criticise me who haven't even ratified that document yet. What is your sense, then, of where you stand? Not in isolation. You now believe that in some way you carry the message for European Look, monetary... we've Europe. won. Battle after battle after battle. We've won it on the common agricultural policy. We've won it on getting Europe finances sound. We've won it on enlarging and opening up the European market. We've won it on freedom of capital movement. We've won it on abolishing exchange controls. We've won it on not having a tax on savings. Time after time. But then it comes to steady, 
argument and consideration on a particular issue. That's quite enough of that because what it doesn't reveal is, first of all, she'd be wearing modern lycra tights. They're not, not what we'd understand as lycra these days, but something which for some reason screamed every time the, the leg crossed the other leg. And you'd hear this sort of... <laughs> and it would sort of vaguely remind you that you were talking to a woman. And... Um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, and, and the critical thing was that she reminded one, and I have the misfortune to have had a boarding education, so my entire adolescence was dominated by Matron. Matron was the only female individual you would ever come across, and you certainly wouldn't have wanted to have sex with Matron. Um, and, 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 but nevertheless, dealing with Matron was a very difficult task. You know, have you washed between your toes? What's that behind your ears? Have you read, look at those fingernails. And I have a feeling that that's how she dominated the cabinet that this cabinet of men sat around imagining that, in fact, they were with Matron, because that was the only person they, too, had ever embraced uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in their adolescence. Uh, in what, to what extent they'd embraced her, that I think one has to leave to history. But, <laughs> but, but there, there she is sitting there, and they're sitting looking at her, and they imagine that she's saying, Kenneth? Kenneth, those fingernails. Oh, <laughs> and I think it completely subjugated them. Well, you can hear it in that clip, because yeah, yeah, she there. clips you. I mean, she, she interrupts does. you, and she says, look, and then goes in and starts. Yeah, but actually, that was very mild. It was much more aggressive than that. I, I didn't want to get any of the bloody ones out. It's a good job you had practice, though, at boarding school, because, I mean, I never had a matron, so I would have been useless to Margaret Thatcher. Oh, I don't know about that. You would have been a woman. You would have taken no shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, it's a shame I haven't uh, got my tights on today. <laughs> but um, anyway, so you always say it was a failure on your part and a huge success uh, on hers. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, Thatcher 20, Jon Snow nil. Really? I never got one round her, that's for sure. And more, more so than any other person you've ever Definitely interviewed? Definitely. Impossible individual to interview. Absolutely <laughs> impossible. Completely impossible. I don't think I ever saw anybody really get her. What was it about her? Why? It was the fact that she was a powerful woman, and the only powerful woman we'd ever met was Matron. I mean, that really was a singularly difficult situation. Would it be and a very now? British situation. The Germans had no problem. I mean, Cole had a problem with her, but that was, that was something else. I don't know what happened. Do you know that, that, uh, that they both, her and Helmut Cole, turned up in the same holiday resort in Austria? And uh, she, she sent a little note to him at his hotel and said, should we meet for tea? And he sent one back saying, I'm terribly sorry, I'm having a serious ministerial conversation. She and Dennis then walked off down the street in, in this little Kitzbühel or wherever it was they were. And damn me, there was Helmut Kohl sitting in a cafe, stuffing his face with a cream bun. <laughs> <laughs> Having a ministerial meeting, hardly. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> now, so that clip, that was, what, 1989? And it was in 1989 that you got yourself a new job. I did, yes. I mean, I didn't want it, I can tell you, because I was really bound up with the Berlin Wall and, and the whole change in the world. It was so exciting, and I was on the road and on the road all the time. And suddenly they said, look, a terrible thing has happened. Peter Sissons has been nicked by the BBC, and he anchors Channel 4 News, and... We need you just to... I know you've never done any anchoring and you're completely useless, but we need somebody to do it. <laughs> Could you do it? And I very reluctantly... Did they said, really say useless? I don't know, but I got the implication that I was stuffing just to sort of <laughs> carry on while they looked for somebody. Well, in fact, they said they were going to look for somebody. Uh, and, and, and I said, well, I, I'll do it as long as I can do a bit of reporting as well. And I did it for about three weeks, and, and I was really grisly. I well, mean, shall we, it, shall we uh, no, judge for no, ourselves? No, 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 I think really? that's not, it's not fair. We have it. We have your Channel 4 debut. Well, have have only on condition you cut it after about 10 seconds. OK, the right. guy's going to listen out for this out the back. Hello, good evening. The fragile agreement within the NATO alliance not to talk to Moscow about removing short-range nuclear weapons from Europe breaks down. Germany's foreign and defence ministers fly to Washington for crisis talks. Messrs Thatcher and Bush agree by...
ですよ。Right, so jolly good, eh? Not bad. I got through about ten seconds without stumbling. Without stumbling. Bloody good job. That was good. That was great. You weren't useless. And clearly, the channel didn't Pretty be useless. Pretty stodgy. Look how fawn I looked. <laughs> fawn and pucker. They really go close, don't they? It was like a close-up. Yeah, up. and that hairstyle. <laughs> that guy needed a tie. <laughs> he certainly um, did. No, that's uh, where it all started. But anyway, I mean, in fact, of course, the, the thing was, over time, I mean, they kept saying... No, initially they said Peter Sissons was going to come back because they were offering him more money. Um, he didn't come back, and then over time they started sort of trying to find anybody else. And you know, it was a bit like the Paxo situation now, you know, I mean, they're, they're out in the hedgerows at the moment. You know, anybody there speak English? And <laughs> 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 um, so um, uh, they, um, uh, after, after about two months, I began to think, gosh, you know, actually, it's quite interesting. And if, if I were to um, keep this going, I mean, the problem is if I don't keep it going, I'm sort of 40 or whatever it was I was then. No, I was a bit less than that. I don't know, something like that. Anyway, I was, you know, in the prime. And um, I thought, the trouble is, if I don't take it now, somebody else will get it. And then when I want to do it, uh, it won't be possible because they'll hang on to it. And um, so then I started trying really hard to get it. And then I did get it. And... Um, I'm hanging on, trying to prevent anybody else <laughs> taking it, you know? And it's a battle. And you're still here. I mean... I know, it's amazing. 25 years later. I know. And you were just... You stepped in for three weeks I and know. you're still there. So how, how did your life change at that point? Because you'd been all over the world. I mean, what, you visited 90-odd countries in your lifetime. Probably, yeah. And now you had your feet under the desk. You had a desk job, in a way. Yeah, except actually I do get out a lot. I mean, you know, I went through the Iraq war. I, I've just been in Greenland. That was very pleasurable. I've been in the Outer Hebrides doing um, the vote, uh, etc. I mean, I get out as much as possible um, because I think, in fact, you need to remain engaged. Otherwise, you become a stuffed shirt. So you don't miss it in any way because you still get enough of I, it. I do enough of it. I'd, I'd like to do a bit more. But, mm -hmm. I mean, somebody went off to Mosul yesterday, went off to Iraq yesterday, and I'd like to have done that, I must admit. Do you get to pull rank over things like that? Uh, not really. I don't get to pull rank about anything. I think I'm terribly important, but in actual fact, <laughs> if you came to any of our editorial meetings, you'd hear me sort of, you know, espousing what I thought we ought to be doing, and, and you'd find we did none of it, so it's fine. <laughs> but I enjoy the, the, the kind of idea that maybe I have some influence, but in mm. fact I have none at all. Uh, but it's fantastic fun. I mean, it's a team, real team. You see, what's rare is that we just produce an hour of television every night. And most people working in that in the news end, and I do feel a bit of a fraud being at DocFest, to be honest, because as I say, I've really only made very few documentaries, one of which I'm very proud of, only one, and that was about art and war, very appropriate this year. I hope Channel 4 will run it again, but I don't think they will. <laughs> when did you make it? About two years ago, three years ago, <laughs> okay. yeah. With Oxford Films, one of the greatest documentary countries, mega companies in the country. Here. They're brilliant, brilliant. But anyway, um, where were we? What was I talking about before I got sidelined? Um, we were talking about Channel 4. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, there mm. it is. I mean, and uh, the team. Yeah, it's a team. And, and the thing mm. is, you've only got the one thing to go for, the one hour. And um, that is a contrast literally from anybody else who's in news, because most people have either got four or five to do in the day, or they're in rolling news. So you can actually do something very special. And then, because we're living in a multi-platform age, you know, you can extract elements and put them on YouTube or wherever else. So the consumption is far, far bigger than we've ever known before. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, you know, if you want to change the world, that's the beginning. It's the beginning, purveying. And in terms out. of your role in that team, yeah. you know, some news anchors, they turn up, you know, maybe an hour or so before they need to go on. They do their bit and then they leave. But with you, I think it's very, very different. I had a chat with Dorothy Byrne a couple of days mm. ago who... I don't know, would you regard Dorothy as one of your bosses, maybe? She is my boss. She is She's your boss. boss. Yeah. Okay. Well, She's I suppose David Abraham mm. is actually my boss. He's the guy who would sack mm. me, I think. Mine probably. too. Oh, yours. He's well, there we are. Too. Have that in common. He's a very nice guy. <laughs> Lovely. <Yeah. laughs> He's quite wonderful, really. He's actually a very good cyclist, too. Uh, he just is. been to Paris. He's just been to Paris, hasn't yeah. he? Yeah. Um, now, Dorothy Byrne is the head of news and current affairs at Channel 4. 
And she said to me the other day, she was like, you know, the great thing about John is that he is there every day, 9.30, for that morning meeting without fail. She's like, he never Only, only four days a week, I mean. Oh, come on. <laughs> is that where you work now, four-day week? No, I've really almost always worked for four-day week. I mean, we only have a half-hour <laughs> program on a Friday. But sometimes we have an hour, so sometimes we're on a Friday, but generally speaking. But it's a long day. It's 11 hours. Mm. The word is that you're always at, working, And you've got a though, peak John. at seven. That's the other thing. Peaking at seven. Yeah. How oh, tough. Grapes. Grapes. Is that yeah. what you do? Is that the trick? Pecans. Oh, good. Almonds. Healthy, John. Well, I mean, you've got a bit of blood sugar surge. Yeah, yeah. 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 Great. Um, so uh, the thing about Dorothy is that she said that uh, you're still as enthusiastic now as you were at the beginning. In fact, if anything, you're even more enthusiastic I'd now than I'm you were more, 25 I'm more years because ago. I can see the potential now is absolutely fantastic, limitless, limitless. I mean, in those days, it didn't feel like you were doing anything very, you know, getting very far. But I think now you feel... Um, the potential is just massive. Just, just, it's extraordinary to receive, you know, contact from Australia or Canada or um, South Africa or wherever it is. Somebody saying, "I saw your interview with X," and you think, "Well, how?" And then, you, well, naturally, YouTube, um, Twitter, you know, Facebook, whatever it was. And and this is amazing. This is amazing. We're not just a parochial dump. We're now cutting the mustard. And so is that what is exciting Quote. for you? <laughs> is that what is exciting? The fact that you can, you can put something out and then you know, you'll look at your phone and then you've got tweets from all over the world and people communicating with you, stories coming directly to you. Is, is that invigorating? Well, I mean, it, I talked about the, the way it's democratised information and communication and I think that that is absolutely amazing. I mean, we... Um, We've had a big push on human rights violations in, in Sri Lanka, um, the, the, the outcome of the civil war in which at least 40,000 Tamils were murdered a, in a safe haven um, by, by the Sinhalese forces. Um, and that was a global issue. And I mean, eventually it changed votes at the UN Human Rights Commission and within the United Nations itself. That's cutting the mustard. And definitely, and you, you, could, you can do that now and you could not do that before. If Channel 4 News had put something out in 1989, a little film about human rights violations in, in, in Sri Lanka, it would not have been seen by anybody other than a few people here, one or two of whom might have taped it and then sent it to somebody. But the light, you didn't send tapes to people. I mean, it was a costly post law, first of all. So, you know, this was... Uh, this, this is a new age. This mm -hmm. is a new age, and it's very amazing. And I think what a lot of people have said to me in kind of conversations leading up to this interview is that you still get your own stories, you know? You're out there on the ground, like the news hound that you always were, and you're still finding your own stories. And in fact, Dorothy did say, she said, he's there firing ideas at the morning meetings, <laughs> And the Nine of which are bonkers and one is viable. In fact, she did say that. <laughs> she said, you're not afraid to have a stupid idea. Oh, yeah, no, I have endless And that's why ideas. you're so brilliant, yeah. because brilliance comes out of, you know... From lunacy. Precisely. Yeah. Mm. And she mentioned one idea where you said, you called her up, I think, probably late one night, and said, Dorothy, I've had an idea. <laughs> and it was about taking the newsroom to India for a yeah. week. Yeah, and we did. We took, the, we, we took the news to Iran long before America thought of talking to Iran. This was about five years ago. And we broadcast from cities in Iran that had never allowed an outside broadcast before, including the holy city of Gom. I'm an Iranophile, incidentally. Terribly excited about Iran coming into the international community. It's a wonderful country, a country in which the people are just like us in so many vivid, real ways. Bright, interesting people, westward-looking desperate for iPads, you know, just great people. Mm -hmm. And we are mad not to be very fully engaged with them. Mm. So we're going to make it. It's going to happen. <clears throat> it's going to change. And it'll change the balance of power in the region. Saudi Arabia will be worried. What is it about Iran for you that has drawn you back again and again over the last, I mean, what, 30 years you've been going back? I, I think um, partly kind of injustice. Um, 
You know, I mean, this country had a revolution um, which, which was fueled in part by outside interference and in part by um, religious fervor. There were all sorts of complicated issues. But I just don't believe that the way to deal with any country is uh, simply to um, cut them off. You know, the Cuba blockade has never worked and has been a complete disaster. Um, although it's sort of preserved in aspect, they're a rather interesting society, but um, and, and old cars and fancy hotels with very jaded fronts. Um, but, but in Iran's case, I mean, the sanctions have been absolutely draconian. I mean, they say there are no sanctions against pharmaceuticals, for example, so that everybody can get their drugs and all the rest of it. But the truth is that there is a total sanction on all international transactions, which has just recently been lifted a little bit because the talks are going well. But what is interesting is that um, actually, when we were there last July filming, um, high-end cancer drugs were completely unobtainable. Unobtainable because you could not undertake the international transaction with Roche or wherever it was to get them. So although there was no sanctions on drugs, and they could say, we don't sanction against drugs, there was a sanction on actually doing a transaction. And as you know, our banks in America have been fined, for, well, our banks have been fined for doing business, HSBC, um, for doing business with Iran, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, I've gone off on a diversion. But that, that's somewhere where I feel politically motivated. Yeah, I feel motivated about getting them engaged with. And, and I'm not, not to say I think the Ayatollah is a great guy or anything like that. It's simply to say, get talking to these people. They're human beings. They're normal. They're like us. Have a go. Mm -hmm. And now they are, which is brilliant, but only out of desperation, only because we want to try and fix Syria. And you still manage, even when you feel the way you do about a place or people like that, you still manage to maintain that impartiality when you're reporting. Well, I, don't really <clears throat> know about I think it's sort of, it depends. One man's impartiality is another woman's despair. Who knows? Is Channel 4 a good place to operate? Brilliant. Marvellous. I mean... I mean, it is great to be in the public sector, beholden to nobody, beholden... I mean, the advertisers... Are, I've, I've, never, I've never had any clash with an advertiser. I don't, I don't know if anybody in here has ever has. Um, the, the, um, the fascinating thing... Occasionally, Tropicana... Do you know, the only, the only, the only um, <laughs> rule we have is if there's an air crash, you mustn't run an ad about flying in aircraft afterwards. Well, that seems reasonable. No, no, you're not allowed to juxtapose serious air collisions with advertising for um, flying. How interesting. Um, I mean, whether that symbolizes what might happen with other things, like, I can't mm -hmm. think of anything else, really. Well, but. I mean, w when I've, uh, I've done a story before that kind of dams orange juice, basically, yeah, Tropicana, there was a conversation, yeah. and Tropicana had to be pulled. You know. I've had to cut down to one glass a day. <laughs> John, don't do it. I'm not going there anymore, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Too much fructose. Um, so, Channel 4, do you think you'd ever go anywhere else? I, nobody else would have me, I can tell you. I mean, I definitely would never have made it to the BBC. Would you ever have wanted to go to the BBC? Well, I mean, I consume a lot of BBC. I'm a tremendous radio fiend. I mean, I really love Radio 4 and Radio 3, um, Radio 6 sometimes. Mm -hmm. But, I mean... Uh, uh, Radio is the ultimate medium. It's an extraordinary thing. Mm -hmm. And it's the one medium that has really blossomed as a result of digitalization. I mean, you know, podcasts, Absolutely. Li it's live streaming. It's amazing, amazing. Um, Do you think the but, BBC but would no, have got on with your ties? Uh, no, come on. Can you imagine it? I mean, they'd have a meeting of the board. They'd sort of say, I, I, I flamboyant ties. I think, really, we can't go there. Uh, isn't it a statement about political situation? Mm -hmm. What about these people here? Are they going to say something? Does anybody have any yeah, questions for do. you? You're checking the no. time. What is the time, John? The time is 20 past. You know, we've only got 20, 10 minutes before the end of the program. We have got 10 minutes. We've, we've got ten, 10 minutes before the, there's a lady in the front row with a hand up, which is a very rare sight when you're sitting here. We're talking about there's a microphone There coming. is a microphone. Microphone, which, bottom corner here. Mm. Bottom corner here, which... which where are our mics? Do you know what? They, they just want to keep it forever because they're going to record you. Oh. Don't worry. <laughs> I d don't be intimidated. It's there. Talking about sanctions, can you hear me? Yeah, we're hearing. Um, and you, 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 what you're saying, they're not really effective, but how would you describe the situation in apartheid South Africa? 
Were they not effective there? Well, funny enough, what really killed them off was sport. Uh, and although it was a sanction of a kind, I mean, it was, it was never economic sanctions that got South Africa. It was the fact that their burly he-man, um, you know, rugby players couldn't couldn't play internationally, and that really was curtains. I mean, it's the lifeblood of a country, or was in those days. Um, so I'd say sporting sanctions worked in that case. Um, but I think, generally speaking, sanctions. But look at Rhodesia. I mean, Zimbabwe now. I mean. Uh, and it, sorry, so long ago the sanctions started against Rhodesia and, and it now, now obviously against Zimbabwe, um, uh, no effect at all. I mean, terrible effect, but, but actually hasn't the same old guys in charge now as was in charge when it all started. My Zimbabwean friend over there might have something to add. But by, by all means. Uh. My wife works in Zimbabwe, so I've got a bit of... I actually have a documentary for her, because I know you, wife is a Zimbabwean. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I want to find out from you if you have any regrets for uh, maybe not covering a possible story or a possible country whereby you might have possibly had some kind of influence. I have massive regrets, and I tell you one of the biggest is the Polisario in, in uh, Western Sahara. Who are, and, and, and the Kurds. I mean, I think there are endless minorities across the world who don't fit the international jigsaw of interest. And, and, and the Polisario, for example, in West, Western Sahara, of whom there are 350,000 or more, I mean, really have been dealt a very, very rough hand indeed. Morocco behaves abominably. Algeria rather just sort of sees it they're there but doesn't do much about it. Um, and the Kurds, I mean, what a massive people not have any territorial place they can call their own. Um, but of course, there's a, there's the awful thing is in the end, however elastic you may think your organization is, there are limits. I mean, I was amazed um, as a cub reporter to be allowed to report from Eritrea. And I reported the, 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 the war in Eritrea had been going on against Ethiopia um, for 50 years when I got there in 1979. It is now independent, but I don't think any thanks to anything we ever did. I mean, I, we did get there, we did report. John Swain uh, reported from there as well, but very few of us ever, ever went there. And there are still, in this modern time, these areas that nobody is, nobody's covering. I haven't seen anything out of Western Sahara in years. But I know it to be a, an ice hole, because occasionally I meet somebody and they tell me. Mm. Up here, there's a fertile row, two people. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Hello. Uh, hi. Um, so, uh, you covered the Sochi Paralympics, didn't you? Did yes. You? Um, what, what was your... Did you... I didn't did you, go to Sochi. I did stuff in the studio here. How, how did you feel about Sochi when they asked you to cover it? How did you feel? Did you want to cover it? Was it something you were... Uh, uh, well, I'd done the Paralympics in London, and, and I was absolutely thrilled, I mean, honoured, amazed to be part of the Paralympic coverage. Channel 4 did superlatively well, and the Paralympians were completely brilliant. And, and the scales fell from our eyes. Do you know that there's a, a lovely woman in a wheelchair in, with a child who takes the child to school every day past our office? And I know in the old days I never made eye contact, and I deliberately began to make eye contact. Now we talk. And I know mm. the child's name, I know, I mean, you know, I think it changed a lot of attitudes, a lot of people's understanding of disability it, and normality it, and the rest of it. It really did. My sister's a disabled athlete due to that coverage. Mm. And, and I know a lot of them and they're incredibly inspiring people. So thank you for, for covering it and bringing it out because you changed my, they changed my sister's life mm. and my life. Mm. So, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Um, I tell you the other thing I was really thrilled to do, I think one of the best things Channel 4 has done recently was uh, Our Gay Wedding, not mine. I, um, but, but Our Gay Wedding was an absolutely fantastic thing. On the day after the first gay weddings, on the Monday after the Sunday, Channel 4 put out something called Our Gay Wedding. And what had happened was that this composer, a uh, gay composer, had married, was marrying a gay singer and uh, the composer had written a musical into which he dropped the wedding. 
it seems by law you only need mm. to speak one small bit of the wedding ceremony, which is the actual vows, and otherwise everything else can be sung. Poor guy had to go off and find a singing registrar. Not an easy thing. <laughs> he found this wonderful Afro-Caribbean woman <clears throat> in Ealing who was a registrar, had a voice to die for, and um, he put together this extraordinary musical. Um, in of which, which we have a clip. We will have a quick look in a moment, but hang on a sec, because he, at one moment he brings in the entire... Uh, London Gay Men's Choir, which is 300 strong. It was staged in, in Ali Pali. And I think one of the most beautiful things was the singing of the two mothers, the mothers of the two rooms, um, each in their own kitchen, recorded, uh, singing about how they'd gone from the despair and distress in finding their boy was gay to the uplift and joy they experienced in them having reached such a fantastic pitch of happiness and understanding and acceptance and the rest of it. It really was a, and no other channel would have done it. I mean, it was a bonkers, mad enterprise. The worst of which was to require me to insert uh, a, a couple of sung uh, news items. And, uh, and I'm afraid to say, I think there may be a clip of that. Shall we quickly watch it? But, Cut it once it gets painful. <laughs> You're watching Channel 4. We're now interrupting tonight's programmes to bring you a news flash. been an estimated 70 same-sex weddings today since the law came into effect at midnight <laughs> for all of Wales and England. Families, friends and loved ones unite and show support <laughs> and many sets of parents including Ben's and Nathan's are contemplating weddings they thought they'd never see. <laughs> Oh. Mm. 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 I, I mean, completely bonkers and very camp, but actually the whole thing bears watching on, on Catch Up on Channel 4. It's fantastic. I mean, yeah. I, I've recently left Channel 4, but I think without a doubt it's one of the things that we all should be proud of. It was fantastic yeah. that it was yeah. on there pretty much on the weekend yeah. that yeah. it was legalised. Uh, and... Brilliant to have you involved in something like that because there aren't many people out there, aren't many people in your spot who maybe have worked in news for their whole career and news anchors that would do that. Well, I mean, you know, it's sort of <laughs> slightly bonkers, but, but, but who would turn it down? Who would turn it down? And that is a complex melodic line, John. Uh, very complex. So there were key changes and time changes, 6, 8 to 4, 3, E, e minor to F sharp. Oh, God, the whole thing was a nightmare, absolute nightmare. There was a quick couple there. Are we all right? To yeah. well, I'm, a, uh, I'm a journalist and also use my bike to cycle everywhere. Good so man. Totally agree You'll go that. far. One thing uh, that ah. you said uh, that troubled me slightly is about impartiality. Surely what we should be doing is being impartial and balanced so that our audience can make up their own minds on what the, dis what the I situation is. I think there's absolutely no question that is precisely what we have to do, but we can never deny who we are. We are not neutral. There is no such thing as a neutral human being. So we are informed by who we personally are and what we personally believe and feel. And that is going to inform the way in which we approach something. But when we put it together, we have got to have complete balance. We've got, and I mean, that's one of the things Ofcom insists upon, balance. And I think we put out very balanced information, but it is informed in part some ways in which we approach the thing by our own feelings and sensitivities. It's just impossible to deny them. And I think if you hose yourself down to the point at which you're able to be so neutral as to be a plastic bag, then, you know, in the end, nobody's going to be picking up on it. And what's lovely is to be as hated as much as you're loved. And occasionally, you know, people do write really vitriolic and nasty stuff. And you think, oh, dear, I, have, I must do better. But then there are other times when people <laughs> say, thank you, I, the scales have fallen my fly, mm -hmm. you know, my, from my eyes and whatever. You know, at the moment, there's a tremendous test on as we deal with the question of these Birmingham schools, the whole issue of Islamic fundamentalism, 
so to the extent to which British values are being eroded and all that sort of stuff. And of course, there's a lot of propaganda out there. There's a lot of, you know, people who are resistant to multiculturalism, et cetera, et cetera. And all, you know, in the end, can I, as a hack that is in favor of a multicultural society, really go around um, kind of trying to operate from the basis in some way that I'm not in favor of a multicultural society? I mean, it's a very difficult problem. And clearly, well, you can get away with it. One way or another. There's another one down one here. here. Uh, hi. Uh, fascinating uh, interview. Thank you very much, Kate and John. Yes, thank you, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Thank you, John. Um, I was struck by... Um, you were saying earlier, John, about how news um, isn't sort of documentary, but... There was a, a film that um, was one of the opening night films here at Sheffield this year called Miners Shot Down, which is about the South African miners who were killed at Marikana. And um, I was thinking about how important the news footage was uh, to that film, yeah. because without that news footage, there would be no film. And actually, the news footage was also vital to the investigation that continues to go on. And I was, in a way, it's more of a plea than a, a question, I suppose, that I would, I would love it if you guys at Channel 4 would go back to that story because it's really in a very crucial mm. stage right now. And one of the things that really frustrates me about the way that news, you know, there's a, there's a kind of commanding narrative that comes out of news sometimes is that the only news story anybody seems to be interested in in South Africa is Oscar Pistorius, which is just, mm. you know, it's just a nonsense yeah. compared to what is actually happening right now in South Africa and the consequence of, of what happened at Marikana. So, um, yeah, that's Well, it. no, I think that's... Great shoes, it, by no, the way, it, 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 It's hugely, hugely uh, accepted. Um, the difficulty is, of course, you know, you're working to a budget. You have very few people. Um, uh, this is no complaint, Dorothy Byrne. Um, but the, 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 that's a fact. And then, you know, you wake up and you've got Mosul, the second town in, in the second city in Iraq, seized by ISIS. Uh, and, and you're having to prioritize all the time. And um, uh, we, yeah, we need to be constantly kept alert. And, um, you know, I, you know send, send me an email and I'll, I'll do whatever I can. jon.snow at itn.co.uk. Um, but it's, um, it is a problem to cover everything we should be covering. I agree with you. The trouble with Pistorius is, of course, it's free live feed from torrenting out of Africa. And, and uh, uh, we've all played our part in, 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 in allowing that to be of any importance, whatever. You're absolutely right. 100%. 100%. I mean, it's a tragedy. It's a sad story uh, for everybody concerned. Um, and, you know, thank God we haven't done much on the hacking trial which would have been very boring because there aren't even any pictures. <laughs> <clears throat> Hello. Hi. Um, thanks both for a great session. Um, it's a question about how you see the future of competition in British broadcasting over the next decade. You talked about some news providers um, not taking risks. And I think speaking from the north of England, I could say I could use the word cowed in relationship to some, some of the BBC's coverage at the moment of... Um, national politics. Um, what I want to ask you is, it seems to me that part of the reason for this is the fact that the BBC is facing the renewal of its charter uh, next year after the election. And it's always a period of time when the BBC gets very twitchy about that. And one of the arguments that's emerging is that in the future, the BBC should be funded by subscription, uh, not by license fee. And as probably most people know, half of all British households at the moment get their television from cable or satellite, i.e. through subscription. But half of British households get their signal through the rooftop aerial, free to air, free point of use. If the BBC moves to subscription, it will have to move to encryption. So having rather set up the argument, forgive me, um, mm. would you be willing to comment a bit on, on that? Well, I mean, I, I, I think the BBC must be preserved at all costs. Uh, and at all costs. Uh, it, it's the greatest broadcasting organization in the world, bar none. The greatest news source in the world, bar none, really. I mean, it's an it absolutely remarkable um, resource that every country on earth envies, except possibly North Korea. 
Um, um, and and um, uh, I, I suspect a problem is going to arise with, with license fee paying, inevitably, because there will be people who just say, I don't take it and I have nothing to do with it, why should I have to pay for it? And therefore, I'm actually fully in favour of, of some kind of trust uh, um, developing in which, you know, in the end, it is state-funded by taxpayers' money or whatever. Because the, 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 the thing about the BBC is it keeps the rest of us straight. It keeps the rest of us trying to compete. And, you know, we do compete. We do compete with the BBC. I think, actually, what we do on Channel 4 News is often better than the BBC can do. Um, and, and that's... That's just good. It's good. And then there are times, there are times when the BBC is better than anything anybody could ever have imagined. And you know that, that would be very true of things that Paxo has done on Newsnight, even the other night, doing the um, the Ofsted uh, interview with with the boss of Ofsted. It was an absolutely perfect, beautifully judged interview. Very sharp, very clever, and got the absolute division between Gove um, and and Ofsted in their their view of of um, uh, inspections and all the rest of it. So the competition is absolutely the essence of truth and all the rest of it, keeping us all straight. And, and the BBC must be funded. Uh, good God, it can't be beyond the imagination of humankind to come up with another funding formula that doesn't exclude anybody uh, and at the same time it, 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 you know, it preserves the BBC as the fantastic, phenomenal global force that it is. It's probably the greatest single cultural asset this country has ever owned, and it's the envy of the world, and I don't even work for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, I think that's, that's well, us. That might be the swan song. Fin finishing on time. Yeah, I better give the BBC my email in case, they, <laughs> in case they'd like to take me on as sort of a... Oh, thank you very much. John Snow, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Wonderful. Good chat. Thank you.